This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. So had some good times this week. Got a little fishing in, got a little skiing in. Randy just left for the Wild Sheep Foundation Sheep Show, so hopefully he's having a good time down there. I'm about to leave to go hunt chuckers this weekend. Super excited about that. Gonna go with my wife and meet up with a couple of friends. First time ever going to chucker hunt. Just good things all around. Uh, got some interesting news for you this week, uh, but before that, we gotta go and see what Michael has going on over in the fishing corner. It's been a great week out here. The second week of January, 2023 is a great year. It's a great year to be alive. You guys saw my trouts last week. I'm really jacked about them still. So last weekend, I went ice fishing with my buddies and we caught a whole mess of perch. It was wild. That was my Saturday. On Sunday, I went fishing with my girlfriend, Cassie. Very famous river here in Montana. We wound up doing okay. We did catch some fish nymphing. Glorified, you know, bobber fishing if you aren't a, a fly dangler. If you're fly fishing this time of year and you're fishing for trout, it's all about midges. Tiny little midges are where it's at. Midges are available to a trout all year, and this is really the time that they key in on them. So that's what I've been doing. Marcus and I got out this week again to go ice fishing. It was awesome. The plan for this weekend is, of course, to go fishing. I've got a big 15-foot spay rod. Uh, I want to try out. I'm going to the clear water later in March, hopefully catch some B-run steelhead. So I'm probably going to be uh, smacking myself in the head practicing with that. If any of you guys spay fish, you know a 15-footer is a, probably something to get used to. So anyways, with that, thank you for your time. Come back next week for another episode of The Fishing Corner. Back to you, Marcus. All right, so here's what we have for news this week. A recent study published in Biological Conservation looked at elk populations in the greater Yellowstone area, which is basically the portions of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho that are close to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, what they found is in this greater Yellowstone area, 92% of the elk rely primarily on private land for their winter range. Around a third of that private land that they're using doesn't have any sort of protection on it. And by protection, I'm talking about protections from that land being developed. In the past, we've talked about how lucky we and the elk are that people had the foresight to protect some of these critical winter ranges. The state wildlife agencies have done a great job of identifying elk habitat and purchasing land for wildlife management areas. Agencies, various organizations, and private landowners have also worked together to purchase or donate a ton of conservation easements on winter range, protecting private land from being further developed. While a ton of great work has been done in the past, this study shows that a lot of important winter range could still be developed, especially when you have shows like Yellowstone convincing everyone that they need to move to Montana and buy their 10 acre ranchette. Speaking of conservation easements, I was tipped off on this uh, on a post I recently saw on Hunt Talk where they linked to an article in Wisconsin where a large conservation easement that was previously approved by the Wisconsin Natural Resource Board is being objected by Wisconsin State Senator Mary Filskowski and other members of that Joint Finance Committee. Conservation easements, if you're unaware, are a voluntary legal agreement usually between a private landowner and a land trust where the landowner is often paid to agree to keep their land undeveloped often in perpetuity. They have been a great tool for preserving natural landscapes and they help wildlife and wildlife habitat out a ton. While the example in Wisconsin seems to be a case of people simply not liking the idea of land forever being undeveloped, there has also been a lot of talk recently about how conservation easements have been used as a loophole to get major tax breaks. Not gonna lie, a lot of this is way over my head, but from what I understand, people will buy undeveloped property, but they get an inflated appraisal for the value of the land if they developed it then they use that difference in values to get a tax deduction. The big example that keeps popping up is Donald Trump's donation of a conservation easement on his New Jersey golf course in 2005. He was able to shelter $39 million in taxable income through this easement. That also brings up uh, the question of things like golf courses should be considered undeveloped enough to qualify for these conservation easements. Anyway, a lot to unpack there. At some point, we really need to get Randy in on this to do a deeper dive as he has a long history of being involved with conservation easements and being a tax accountant. Seems like the right guy to talk to. Elk in Montana. People are fired up. Stakeholders of all types continue to argue about how elk should be managed in the state. I feel like at times there's the mentality that everything is on fire when we talk about elk in Montana, but something struck me at a recent Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission meeting 
and uh, it felt pretty profound to me. Commissioner Pat Byworth gave a bit of a farewell speech as his term was coming to an end. He talked about his career in wildlife management, he talked about serving on the commission, he talked about how wildlife management is difficult because of all the passions that arise in Montana. He talked about how he started to hunt in 1970 and how a lot of wildlife, including elk, were very scarce in a lot of the state. He went on to say, quote, I consider this an amazing success story in Montana wildlife, where we argue more now about abundance than we do scarcity. Anyway, the take home message I got from that was to remember to be thankful that we have something to argue about. In the scheme of things, it wasn't really that long ago when we basically had no elk. But now we do have a lot of elk in Montana, which is pretty sweet. And while the public access can be tricky at times and the field can be very crowded at certain times, there are still amazing opportunities to be had out there. With all of that said, yes, there are issues, especially with the push to privatize wildlife, rewarding those with the deepest pockets at the expense of the public land hunter. A lot of the danger recently comes in the form of political moves rather than Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and that's why people are fired up and on high alert with the upcoming legislature. A lot can also be done to manage elk better, improve public access, and work with stakeholders to create regulations and systems that provide positive results for the greatest number of people. Montanans have been discussing this forever, but there are two events in the upcoming weeks where they are getting together to discuss elk management, starting with this Saturday, January 14th. The event is part of the final day of the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association Winter Convention. It is open to the public where you can sit down and listen to panelists from various stakeholder groups to discuss how elk should be managed. It'll be at the Delta Colonial Hotel in Helena, Montana from 8.30 to noon. And then another event on January 24th, they're calling Elk Camp at the Capitol, where Montana Montana hunters and English are encouraged to show up to the Capitol to celebrate our outdoor legacy and talk with lawmakers who are making decisions about public lands, wildlife heritage, and shared public access. There are a number of buses that can take you to the Capitol from Billings, Livingston, Bozeman, and Missoula, and you can see a schedule of the event and learn more about it at montanaelk.org. On a national level, new rules were adopted by the House of Representatives allowing for easier transfer of federal land to state and local governments. If you want to read an in-depth discussion on this, go to the Hunt Talk forum and look at Randy's thread titled Public Lands, the Congressional Football. If you're unaware, there has long been a trend to try and transfer federal land to the states. The idea of taking lands like Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, Fish Wildlife Service, taking that land and transferring it to the states, handing ownership over to local state land boards to manage. While on the surface, many find this to be a good thing, thinking that land would better be managed at a local level, history has shown us otherwise. Years ago, Randy made a detailed video series showing why it does not work. I'll link to those videos in the video description. If you're unaware of the situation, I highly recommend checking out those videos. Randy goes into a lot of detail just showing exactly case by case why transferring to the states is a bad idea, especially from the perspective of a public land hunter. The basic storyline often goes like this. The state land boards are obligated to turn a profit and they cannot afford to manage these lands and they end up selling them. It's just a different route to privatization of the land and public resources. For the deeper dive this week, we are talking about hunting in media, especially in terms of promoting public land hunting. Randy, Michael, Jason, and I are gonna talk about our thoughts on the type of media we produce and whether it's good or bad. We got right. crap in the last episode for having a tangle mess of cords. So I cleaned it up. Look, yeah, well, look, it it's looks real, really nice. Real nice. Let him snow. <laughs> we cut our uh, participants in about half this time. We got. Yeah, that's because you grabbed such a controversial topic from <laughs> everyone. Was scared. It was Michael's idea. Honestly. It was my I, idea. I was I was like, anyone, anyone have an idea? And Michael's like, I have an idea. Yeah. Huh. So here we are. All right. Well, there's a lot of buzz about this topic. There is. Let it rip. What is it? I saw the header. What is it, Marcus? Well, wait, uh, yeah. Anyway, hunting and media and how mm-hmm. it's changed. I don't know. I think I, from my perspective, it has changed a lot in the last four years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, well, it's been changing constantly. It's right. been a gradual progression of just mm-hmm. how we consume hunting and media. Yep. Started out in, you know, probably oral storytelling all the way up <laughs> into YouTube videos that we have now and yeah. podcasts and whatever. So. Yep. Anyway, I I don't I tried to write some points down. I sent them to you guys to try to keep ourselves uh, a little on track. Mm-hmm. But I feel maybe we start with why the reason that hunters are upset, and that's like the big deal. So hunters are starting to get upset about hunting and media. I think along mm-hmm. for a long time, some there might be people who are mad at hunting media in, in general for mm-hmm. whatever reason. 
But now hunters are getting more upset at hunters and media, especially public land hunting, Mm -hmm. because of overcrowding, monetizing public resource, Mm -hmm. like the perceived privatization, influencers taking more than their fair share. It's harder to get a tag. So it's a lot easier to find public access. It's a lower barrier to entry. It's, the spread of information is super fast, and there's a, just a big increase in Western and public land hunting media. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the interesting points, because I, I want to hear from your perspective. Yeah. Because when you got into it, mm-hmm. it was like you were like one of the first yeah. who started to promote hunting and public lands in the West. Yep. Like for a long, I mean. I did. Well, okay. I so did. there's there's like books and right. you know magazine articles, Jack O'Connor, whatever. There's that, but as far as video production, mm-hmm. I feel like you were one of the people in the front of that. So I think right. that for me is what's changed a ton in the last like mm-hmm. ten years. When when I started researching this in 2007 and 2008, there were over 400 TV shows, and that was the primary place where people saw video on hunting. Right. There was not one public land show. Zero out of 400 and some. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service study said that in the West, 70% of hunters primarily hunted on public land. And 90% of hunters hunted without outfitters. So why, when our area, you know, the places we hunt, why were there no platforms doing that? None talking about the importance of public land, about conservation, about all these things. So... I started doing surveys out on my hunt talk forum, out on Bow's site, out on other places. I did surveys. If new content came in, what would you want it to be? Like 90, I still have those surveys in an old file cabinet. Over 90% would have said, I want, I want to see something that's hunting like I do it. Right. Well, that's like, so, I feel like when you started it, this seemed like it was a very unique thing compared to other hunting videos. Mm-hmm. And it, I feel like it wasn't, from the public land hunter's perspective, it wasn't that controversial. It was like, the, mm-hmm. I, I feel like the large, the, the majority of people were excited about it. Mm-hmm. It was this new thing. Yep. And so that's been, to me, that's like the discussion I want to have is like a proportion of those people are now getting upset at how public land hunting media has grown. And it's just like over, I don't know. Yeah, it's just because it's just it's changed so rapidly. Yeah, like, it's just like a shift, constant shifting baseline of like how people react to to what they're seeing. And you, I think it's I don't mean to steal all the talk here, but one of the points you mentioned was what are we giving back? Or that was in one of your points, taking more than you're giving back. Right. When I started these platforms, it was a because I wanted to provide a bigger voice for public land issues, for land and water conservation fund, to stop state transfer to, I mean, the list goes on and on and on of all the things that that's what I wanted to do these for. I think is a fair criticism of outdoor media that collectively we give back very little compared to what we get out of it. And so anyone in outdoor media who can't handle that criticism, either ought to get out of the kitchen because the heat's a little hot or maybe you ought to look at what you do in your content what you do for activism what you do for volunteerism what you're doing to lead and using your platforms to give more than you're taking or else except that collectively we're going to get thrown under the bus uh i'm not going to defend any of that right i i think so that transition you're talking about marcus i think as the barriers entry have become so low because when i started a tv show it cost me $300,000 to hire a production company. It cost me $180,000 of airtime buy, and I had $25,000 of sponsorship. That's a pretty high barrier of entry. Now you got Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, blah, blah, blah. Anybody with a camera is out there. Right. And so. Well, that's the thing. I think it's never, the hard part is it's usually never one thing that's causing a problem. Oh. And to say that there isn't a problem and how you define a problem is different for everyone. Yeah. But like, you can't ignore that there has been a change, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's yeah. fascinating. And I'm curious what, uh, yeah. What did, Michael, Mike, Michael, well, why so, did you pick it as a topic? Well, okay. Well, so, well, this is what's interesting to me to like introduce, I mean, you guys can introduce yourselves in this context, but you guys are somewhat a product of hunting media in your like, Growing into 
Hundred percent hunting, hunting yeah. right? I mean, I so that's so. why I think it's going to be interesting for <clears throat> you because, it, like, over the last however many years, you guys have—I mean, when did you start hunting? And then, like, in your viewpoint, it's been a very short amount of time in the scheme of things. And like, how have you perceived hunting media? Yeah, I think that. Well, let me just say that I'm definitely a product of of hunting media. It was, you know, I had a friend that introduced introduced me into hunting and told me to check out a certain show. And I watched that show and realized that it was it was feasible for me to go buy a bow and get a tree stand and go, you know, sit in a tree and look for a buck. And, you know, that turned into I wanted to film my own hunts. Um, and, like, I, I, I do want to say that I think in the past couple of years, a lot of – there's been a lot of platforms that have done a better job of talking about the conservation aspect, the land management aspect, Um you know, her dynamics, all that stuff. It's gotten a lot better since, you know, the early 2000s, early 90s, where it was just like bang, bang, shoot them up. Right. Like, nowadays, one of the things that I really appreciated about that show that I watched was they talked a lot about the land management. And this is, like, completely different from what we do because yeah. we hunt public land. But at least in, you know, I can give, give credit to that show that they talked about the the, the uh, conservation and, and really the land management and – and, in, and uh, what am I trying to say? Like increasing the, um, you know, overall habitat, not only for the deer that they were trying to grow, but just like everything, you know, like a lot of those properties, they got big deer, but they also got tons of pheasants, tons of, you know, other small game and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how I, I, I feel like, you know, I rest my head or I can sleep well at night knowing that we are, I feel like we're doing more benefit than harm, you know, showing the hunting content that we do. Um, because a lot of times we're talking about the conservation behind it and, you know, we're educating people rather than just ta- like trying to go after the biggest bull elk or, right. or what have you. So I've, I've seen, you know, I came from a white tail space and a lot of those, those media platforms are all about growing the biggest deer all about, you know, like harvesting the biggest buck. And that's, you know, that's cool and all, but that's not really, it's, it's very like superficial, I guess. Like there's not much depth to it. Um, so I've seen certain platforms and I think that we do a great job of it talking about the bigger story and like the landscape and, uh, you know, learning about the specific animals that we're hunting. So that in, in that way, I've seen it change, uh, for the better. I don't know. Like, what do you think, Jace? Like, have you seen it turn for the better or for the worse the past couple of years? I mean, I think I've seen I've seen both sides of it. I mean, from my experience, like Marcus was saying, about five years ago, I had kind of got into hunting, dove in head first. I it started off with someone offering me to take me on a hunt that fell through, and I just got interested and I was like, I want to do this. How do I learn how to do it by myself? Started buying books, started watching YouTube, and as someone who's new to hunting, you hit the online internets and start typing, how do I do this? Where do I do this at? And it was, I picked up on it fairly quickly, how there was like kind of a couple different varieties of hunting content, whether that's kill shot compilations to public land access stories and conservation sort and like, um, and the food aspect of that hunting stuff. So naturally I gravitated toward more of the, that the side of it where there was some conservation pieces, food aspect and all that stuff. And, um, so yeah, I think you, it's easy to tell that there's the two sides of it. And I mean, I, I wouldn't say I see more of the bad, uh, bad side now than I did before, but I don't know. It's also like where you like choose to look, you know, like totally you, it's, you can look at it as like, this show is only showing like, this is what's wrong with hunting because like this show is only showing, you know, 30 minutes, 30, 30 kill shots with the way like like, social media platforms are set up nowadays. It's so easy to just almost be in a little bit of a bubble. And like, these are what I, these are the people I like to watch. And these are the people I like to listen to, to where you almost shield yourself from the other side of it until you maybe see an article headline here or there where something's kind of blown up where there's a bad look on something. So I guess I've, I don't know. I don't look, go looking for some of that other stuff, but. So I guess here's another idea. So 
regardless of the quality of the message, like whether we're promoting conservation or whatever. What do you guys think about just the role of hunting media in putting more people in the field? Like, do you think it has had a big impact? And then, like, is that a is that a, an issue that? From my short experience, I'm probably one of the guys that everyone hates because I'm one of the newer guys, <laughs> and I'm I'm the new truck at the trailhead per se. So, I guess I can't speak for the other half, but I think I think it's. I mean, I'm thankful for it because it helped me get to where. I can go out and hunt on my own and stuff like that. So I'm grateful for the the media that helped, that yeah. helped put me out there. But I can see the other side of it where maybe there there is a little bit of people in your spot that you didn't have people in there before. Yeah, so. Randy, you obviously have had like the <laughs> longest tenure of mm-hmm. viewing this. So, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's definitely new people getting into hunting. Right. You know, I, I did a podcast with Larry Jones, Corey Jacobson and I did. And if any of you who watch Larry Jones and Dwight Shoe, their old elk calling videos, Larry said to me and Corey said, I'm so glad you guys are now the ones who are ruining hunting. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be me and Dwight. Right. So this discussion has been, been, it's been cast out there forever before it was print. You know, let's say Eastman's did an article about hunting mule deer in Colorado. Oh, they just ruined it. Colorado mule deer hunting. That, that was, you read that all the time and heard about that all the time in the 90s. And then it becomes to video. Video becomes popular. And then it becomes social media. All of those have an impact. And it's, it's more recognizable when it happens in your backyard or in your favorite spot, especially when we're losing access. Right. Okay? Nationwide, we're, we're, hunter numbers are decreasing. Even though hunters across, in like in Montana, we've seen an 8.7% increase in hunters since 2011, resident hunters. Right. And we've seen a 220% increase in non-resident hunters. But what has happened? We've lost more accessible hunting land. So it feels way more congested than what it probably is in true numbers. So yeah. there's... You, you can't talk about one without, you can't talk about crowding without, and only talk about numbers. You got to talk about access, Mm -hmm. all those kind of things. So these are really complicated uh, discussions. I, I mean, there's a reason that I read sports of field and outdoor life and field and stream when I was a teenager, it was in the library and I'd go read it. And that's why you and I ended up going to British Columbia because I read that in 2000, you know, whatever I was when I was 14 years old. Yeah. There's always been media that's done that. If you go back to when George Bird Grinnell started as the editor of Forest and Stream, which is now Field and Stream, the same comments were being made about now all the, they called them nature fakers at the time. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt and him got in a big argument because Grinnell said Roosevelt was a nature faker. <laughs> And, and so there was these criticisms of who really deserves to be out here and, and stuff like that. So it, it goes back forever, but it doesn't mean we ignore it. We accept that inherent when you decide you're going to do media, and we do a lot more than just video. Right. And so that's, I know a lot of people want to focus on video, but you look at our podcast. Last year, we published 30 podcasts. 18 of them were on conservation issues. And those don't get the downloads that shoot them up bigger, you know, 10 ways to kill a bigger buck this year. The conservation ones, the policy ones, the politics ones don't get nearly the downloads. But that's what our mission is. What, what, you know, when Matt Ranella started criticizing the whole social media stuff. Right. I had Paul go through and look at all of our social media posts from November of 2021. I think we're, yeah, 21. We had like 18 posts that month on Instagram. Only one of them, it was Dale's Elk. That was the only traditional grip and grin. And it had five times the level of engagement. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. when we're talking about media, media is has a production side and a consumption side. So for all those who are complaining about what's being produced, well, you're training the algorithm to only show traditional grip and grin and glorify the kill and all this stuff because that same time we had some conservation thing some access thing that was going on and we may as well just posted those out on a billboard here uh, on a (laughs) on a fence post 
So, I, yeah, I accept that there's these criticisms, but I also say, how much of this is the consumer, right? If for sure, if if this kind of stuff, the information parts of it, you know, if all that wasn't being consumed, the algorithm wouldn't serve it to you, and nobody would produce it. So it's it's easy to, like you said earlier, Marcus, it's easy to simplify these. It's a lot more complex than just the, oh, I want to be mad at this or mad at that. Because media inherently is about messaging. So inherently, we accept there's going to be some consequences that if we were to, you know, say, here's a trailhead sign, more people would show up there. So we try not to do that, right? You guys are, yeah. we're, we're always just trying to get rid of skylines to the degree possible, stuff like that. So there's inherent things. So what can we do that gives back? What, what, how can we do more? And it's not like we're going to use our platforms to say, oh, we worked on this and we did that. And, oh, we spent four hours here, blah, 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 blah. We're, we're not going to bore you with all that. Other than Michael says he sleeps well at night knowing how we use our platforms. I sleep really well at night knowing how hard we work at these other things on the board here. And I don't know if they're showing up on this yeah. camera, but, you know, we deliberately force 40%, 45% of our content in the off season to be these things that are part of our mission that aren't about, you know, big bulls, big bucks, adventure, whatever. Right. Yeah. So, and I, th I think that's why it's good to just continue to talk about it mm -hmm. and just to keep thinking about those things and checking ourselves. Yeah. And like, cause that I play mental gymnastics in my head all the time about, <laughs> am I doing more good than bad? And uh -huh. cause like, the greedy part of me has seen, yeah, I've seen the increase of people at the trailhead and I get frustrated because that's like my favorite thing to do in life. Mm -hmm. And then I see all these people and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, yeah. what are we doing? You know, but it's not, A, it's not all us. And then it's just, there's so many factors at play too, like in terms of preserving hunting rights and just like having people care about a resource. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm just like constantly asking myself, like, are Overall, is the resource better off with or without the media that we produce? And mm -hmm. I, I think that it's better. And I, and I don't want to, the day that I don't is when I stop doing this. No, I, And I, so that's what I just yeah. like constantly want to ask myself. And, and like, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But it's just like to try to at least think about it and be proactive about it, I think mm -hmm. is helpful. I think uh, we ask ourselves that all the time. You know, yeah, what, any, any trip we go out when we build our storybooks. You know, our storybooks, I've seen storybooks before when I've been involved in other things. They're not nearly as deep into conservation of landscape, of species, of stuff as ours are. Uh, so I I get it. And I'm happy. I don't want to say I'm happy to read the criticism, right? You know, we're humans. We don't, we don't want to be criticized. But I fully understand it. And I'm glad that it holds us accountable to that decision that you guys say we have to make. Are we doing more as an, are, are we a net benefit and how can we be even more of a net benefit? And that criticism, if you get that criticism and you run from it and you're worried about it and, oh, someone's picking on me, then maybe look in the mirror and see if maybe you're being picked on for a reason. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, no, it's, it's good. I mean, obviously you, you have been involved with it for so long and, just like I've seen it from all the different angles, so I think your your input's really valuable. We're just these young bucks that are trying <laughs> to figure everything out. Well, and I'll say that about an age thing also, okay? And this is why my give-a-shit meter on this stuff doesn't spin real hard because I've been blessed to have unbelievable opportunities because people before me went and did things. Okay, my first legislative session in 1993, when Jim Posowitz, Jack Atchison Sr., Tony Shunan went and fought to create access for state lands. We couldn't hunt, camp, fish, hike on state lands. And here I am, I'm like 29 years old, took a day off the CPA firm because I'm like, wow, this could be a lot of access. Those guys didn't get up there and say, well, I don't know if we should do this because that would, you know, I hunt here and I don't want a bunch of people there. It, every, every mentor I had in conservation was about, 
how do I make it better for the people who come after me? And that's just kind of, I'm a product of that. And so if my give a shit meter doesn't get too worked up about, you know, someone saying, well, my trailhead's crowded now. You know, I get that. Let's work on access then. Let's, let's get more trailheads. Yeah. Let, let's find more ways to get to these pieces of land. Instead of circling the wagons and saying, well, this is my little piece of the pie and the hell with the rest of you guys. That is not the culture of hunting and conservation that got us here. And uh, it's, I'm riding that horse till they bury me, and maybe they'll say, oh, that guy, he was an <laughs> idiot. What a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, if, if those guys who came before me would have just done it for their own self-serving purposes... We wouldn't have stream access law in Montana. We wouldn't have the right to hunt on state lands. We wouldn't have a Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and 1.2 million acres of new and improved access. We, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Those people didn't do that because, oh, I can, make, I can protect my own little hunting spot. And coming up through that, that's why I started these platforms in 2008. I wanted to give more voice to the public land side of it. So. Well, that's that's a great point to end on as we hit our twenty-two minute cap. <laughs> oh, oh, 22? twenty-two. I I just uh, in session twenty-two. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jace, I hogged all the time. No, I was good. I was good. Oh. I'd be interested to see, like, just closing thought. Thought it was like the correlation between like people complaining and moaning and about you know like oh, there's too many people at their tra- at the trailhead and like have you ever called anyone or volunteered or done anything to, to help benefit the situation. Um, you know, if you find yourself doing that, maybe think about what you can do or how you can help, you know, the yeah, situation. rather than tearing down, build, build up. Yeah. yeah. Well, we just did our, you know, the 2% for conservation that we're a certified member. Of. I just sent that in the other day on Monday, yesterday. We three and a half percent of our gross revenues went to conservation 56 days of employee labor got donated to conservation and we're not a very big group. So when I look at that, I'm like, yeah, we're on track for doing the things that are in our mission. And I would hope other groups that produce media look at those kind of things and say, okay, here's some ways I can measure if I'm doing what I need to do. Well, thanks Randy. Thanks Jace. Thanks Michael. Thank you guys. Thanks.